it's all up to you. So um, let's get started. Once one more time, I'm just apologize for being late, um, but thank you for your patience. Um, I'm Emily, and uh, this is my husband Scott, better known as Earl. Um, we are both Alpine Shop. Uh, I guess you call us special event employees. We help out with. Um, oh, one more second. Uh, we help out with special events um, for the store. We've also worked, um, each of us, uh, in, the sh in the shop at one point in time at the Kirkwood Mothership. Um, so we've been uh, riding bikes for each a long time. I think we, I entered my first gravel event in like 2012, potentially. Um, so coming up on 10 years, would you say you're about the same? Uh, mine was 2000. I think 2014, 2015, somewhere was a, yeah, I did one in 14. My first big one was probably in 2015. Yeah. Um, so we're both kind of longtime gravel riders, longtime tour of Herman participants. Uh, we've each done all five of the loops uh, on multiple occasions. So, and actually we would just took a, a weekend trip out to Herman, um, maybe uh, like two, so, two or three Probably weeks. about a month ago. About a month ago, yep. Um, Pre-road uh, loops one, three, and five. So they're all actually in really good shape. Uh, loop five has a creek crossing, that a brand new bridge that's getting built. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and yeah, Herman's just a great town. I mean, the event, the tour of Herman is great. It's May 1st and 2nd this year, but Herman is just a great place to visit uh, even outside of the event. So these loops are available on the Off-Road Racing League website. You can get the GPS file um, or the key, print your own cue cards and just really go ride them anytime. So um, we love to have you for the event. It's obviously exciting. There's timing um, and just the you know festive atmosphere that I know a lot of us have been missing with COVID <laughs> canceling last year's event. Um, but we're just you know excited to have you for the race itself. But again, like gravel is always there. So. Um, feel free to check it out. So we're going to go over uh, just some gravel, uh, kind of here's our agenda for the, the session. Um, we'll just run through what is a gravel bike, what kind of bike do you need um, to participate in these events. Spoiler alert, basically any bike is fine, but um, we'll just kind of go through some, some features that help improve your bike mechanically. Um, we'll go through kind of some tips and tricks for keeping you comfortable, both from a training preparation perspective and then like a day of perspective. Um, and then we'll just kind of uh, talk about some tips and tricks for the actual day. We'll have some tour of Herman specific um, uh, suggestions uh, that we'll share. And then also just in general, like any gravel event, um, you know, there's being in the Midwest, uh, we have lots and lots of options. So um, that's kind of our agenda for the day. Once again, if you have questions as we go along, please put them in the chat and we will address them live as we can. And then um, at the end, we'll have some question time, some time for open Q and A. Um, okay, so let's get started. Earl, what's a gravel bike? Uh, any bike that will go down gravel. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that's the thing is is tour of Herman is um, we have it kind of geared to, you know, it's, it can be a beginner event. It's gonna be, you know, it's a, an event that a lot of people use as they're getting their first toe wet uh, in, in a gravel event. So, uh, you know, it's nice to have a gravel bike, but a mountain bike or, you know, a hybrid with a decent, you know, a little heavier tire on it would work just fine. Um, but, you know, once you kind of get into the gravel scene, a lot of people will transfer to uh, a gravel bike. And a gravel bike is basically, it looks, can you? Yes. Let's so adjust this, the camera here. This is, this is Emily's bike and, it, you know, it has the drop bar to it. So it looked, you'd say, oh, it looks like a road bike. But the geometry is spread out a little bit longer. So it's a little longer and the fork which has a little more rake. So it. It rides a little bit smoother on rougher terrain than what a road bike would do. And then it's got a little wider clearance in the rear triangle and the fork so that you can run a little bit wider tire. And then um, just a heavier tire that, you know, most of the gravel bikes will have 
more of a knob on the outside edge and then a smooth center with kind of a, a harder compound so it's gonna you guys roll. you guys ready for a zoom i'm gonna we're gonna yeah. we're gonna check it out here also welcome to our basement by the way okay so let's talk about these tires so you can see that you have a little bit of knobby edge on the outside here and then in the center it's more smooth and then a lot of tires will have a, like a harder compound in the middle so if you're on harder services it will roll a little bit better but then you're also getting the traction of a, a knobbier tire on the outside on rough, looser surfaces. All right, and then can you point out like mud clearance? Okay, so then the other thing you're looking at is distance here. Um, on a, and it's just, this one's a little bit wider and then also you get it down there, kind of hard to see, but right mm -hmm. in here. Mm -hmm. Whereas a road bike is going to have a little tighter geometry, so you're going to run little narrower tires. And then this bike, I don't know, is it five or six years old? And the newer bikes, you're going to see even a wider gap here, so that some of some of the gravel bikes now are set up to where you can even run like a a two two or two point one uh, mountain bike tire. If you know they're just going to that level right now. All right, talk about uh, the cockpit up here. Right. Yep. This right yep. here. I'm taking you with us, everybody. Okay. So Emily has a lot going on up here because she likes different options. So we have just your normal handlebars with hoods and shifters. Um, she also has an aero bar set up. Um, so in regards to aero bars, you do see people that have aero bars on gravel bikes, but it's highly recommended not to you be in your arrows when you're in large groups of people or you're pace lining, um, you just can't get to the brakes fast enough. And there's gonna be sections on the uh, Tour Herman where you're on the Katy Trail and it's early on and it's just not safe if you're in a group of people there, especially to be on your arrows because if somebody taps the brake, it's just gonna get, might not turn out real well. Um, the other thing is, is we have, she has her mount here for her Garmin. And then also, this is another garment mount that she has set up with just a, a clip. So these are like cue sheets from other races. Uh, Herman's all gonna be on Garmin. I don't think you're gonna have- You can cards. print your own. Or if, but you can, if you print your own, you just, is what we do is you, you'll print, we print our own and then we use uh, contact paper to laminate the front and the back so it becomes waterproof but you wanna write any notes on it before you contact it. But then we just have a little clip set up here so that each, so then it's visible as you're riding. So you don't have to like pull it out of your pocket or pull it out of the back of your jersey pocket or whatever. So it's just nice here. And then um, I, is how I would do that is if there's multiple sheets for loop one, I'd put those sheets in here. And then after you finish each one, just take it out, put it in your jersey pocket, and then the next one would be below. Um, and that, that seems to work pretty well. And then you just, each time you loop, you just grab your next set for each one. Um, there's no reason to carry your cue cards for the, uh, only for the loop that you're on, to make the most sense. Um, that pretty much covers this. Uh, Will you put out the light mount just for uh, any yeah. overachievers? So we, to a Herman, you're not going to need front lights. Um, you might want to run a rear red blinky light. Um, but right here is a, a mount for our, our bike lights that we would use if we're doing races where you're going to be out overnight and you need some lighting there. So that's there. It's, all right, I'm going to come bring you back to the camera here. So uh, the cockpit, it's just a really, it's always a challenge to set up for the gravel bike um, because you have a lot of things to balance. You have your navigation method. So that's uh, most people will use the Garmin just because they're pretty popular, but there are other GPS devices, Wahoo, um, Lazine. So there's, there's other GPS navigation options. Um, and then if you're going analog with a printed, or handwritten cue cards, you need to balance that. 
Um, and then, like Earl said, if you're going overnight in a longer race, you need to have a way to have lights on there. So it's just like, there's a lot going right. on. So that's something that you should work out before whatever event you're going to do before the event, make sure to have a test run of, you know, this is where I'm going to put my GPS device. This is where I'm going to put my cue cards or map. This is uh, where I'm going to put my uh, uh, bike computer to show speed and distance if right. I want to have some other screen showing on my GPS. Yeah, that's one thing we didn't have on Emily's bike was her just plain and simple odometer. And we both run those as well, just because in case your Garmin does, for whatever reason, decide not to work that day, you can still measure distances for your turns and keep track of your mileage. So um, it never hurts to have old school technology with you. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions. Number one, do you provide GPX files? Uh, I want to, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I believe the answer is yes, there's a separate GPX file for each loop of the tour of Herman. So it's uh, the rider's responsibility if they're going to use that feature to go on the Off-Road Racing League website, download that, get it onto their device, and then uh, be ready to press go uh, when you're starting any particular loop. They might already be out there. I think they are. Yeah. But the only thing would be is if there isn't any last minute changes. But the thing is, is that two things is we do provide the um, garments but then also not all intersections are marked but we do try to also physically mark the course to some extent um, as a check and there are, I mean there are there are several people that just don't have a garment or some GPS device which is perfectly fine and you know when gravel first started they were completely against uh, GPS devices everything was um, Q paper Q paper Q sheets. Q sheets because they wanted it to be the adventure of also not of navigation or not getting lost you know nothing worse than going out and doing a 200 mile ride and you made it a 225 mile because you were tired and missed a turn which that might have happened i don't know yeah <laughs> <laughs> definitely not us <laughs> But um, yeah, so what um, happened to me? Another one thing that I just want to mention, and sometimes I forget about it because I personally uh, don't use my phone for navigation, but like a lot of people do. So that's another option to have a phone mount. Um, it's not my style just because like the phone kind of takes up a lot of real estate, but um, that's another great option to uh, use your phone as the navigation device. Uh, there's plenty of apps out there that will um, take a GPX file and just give you that turn by turn navigation. Oh, hi, there's a puppy here. Hi, cutie. <laughs> we love dogs. Um, okay, second question in the chat is Are there cutoff times for the tour of Herman? Um, I, I'm not sure about this one either, to be honest. Yeah, well, there is, and they should be posted because. Uh, we don't want people to get themselves, we want everybody in before it gets dark just because it gets dangerous. Um, so I think each day we'll have a cutoff time. Um, like sunset. Basically. Well, you need to be back before sunset, but I think that to leave out on loop three, let's just say you need to probably go somewhere between around probably two or three o'clock. And then I know on Sunday, there's also a cutoff to leave out on the second, on um, what would be loop five. And I think that's normally somewhere around one or two o'clock. So there are going to be cutoffs. And the only reason that we have those is so, to get everybody back in before dark, especially Saturday night, just because there's a lot of wineries in that. Uh, basically both days, there's a lot of wineries around and you just have people driving around. So you do need to be vigilant of that when you're on the paved surfaces, but on the gravels, it's very nice and peaceful and really quiet. So, and the course is open. So we, it's like, there are no closed roads. So you do have to follow uh, basic rules of the road and, you know, cars are cars and we're bikes. So you just have to be careful. Yes, agreed. Um, okay, any other thoughts about bikes? Uh, a couple other ones that I'm going to bring up is this is a bent, what we call a bento oh, box. We're going for the zoom again. So a nice place to store 
uh, Girl Scout cookies. Oh, Girl that Scout were, cookies. That weren't eaten yes. on the last ride. Um, and, you know, this is a nice place to keep snacks. Um, if you need a little extra space for a phone or something, this is a good place to go with this. Water bottle cages to hold your water bottles. Um, so one thing to check is, you know, when you're riding on the road, the water bottles normally always stay in place. At multiple gravel events that we've done, you start hitting bumps. And if you don't have tight cages, the bottle's gonna pop out. So one thing that I have done in the past is you get like a hair scrunchie or the- A hair tie. A hair tie that's got some elastic to it. And just use that to hook and then loop it over. Let's just say this one better. I'd have that back here and then have it loop up and come around the top of the bottle. So it doesn't, it keeps it from popping out because there's certain routes where it's just, you start hitting some washboardy stuff or whatever. And if your cages are loose, the bottle's going to pop out. And sometimes you don't even notice it's gone until you go to grab it. Or it's one other thing where you're, and if yours goes, there's probably other people too that the same thing happens. So just check your system to make sure that if the bottle is a little bit loose, come up with a little system to hold it in place. Yep. All right, any other questions for bike setup? You wanna go through? Yeah, we'll get into like tools and accessories. Um, but kind of the bottom line is uh, mountain bike, like run what you run. So mountain bikes are great to start out in the gravel world. Hybrid with a beefier tire is great. Cyclocross bike is great. Um, road bikes even, if you're a confident bike handler and you've got some bomb-proof tires. Uh, I mean, we've seen it. We've right. seen it out there. Uh, Enduro bikes, if you want a really big workout going up the hills, great. Um, that's just what the, the beautiful thing about gravel is that so many, um, so many bikes and so many people can participate. It's kind of like the meshing of all cycling cultures. Um, okay, so question in the chat, what tire brand do you use? Great question. This is also um, like, if you see a hundred gravel riders, you'll probably get a hundred different tire <laughs> preferences. Um, they're kind of all over the board. And I know uh, the year that, uh, so there's a famous race in Kansas that is now uh, called the Unbound and it's 200 miles long in Emporia. Uh, the, the first year that I did that, I spent like 10 hours probably on the internet, like, oh my gosh, what tire should I use? And I had a lot of uh, anxiety about flats. Um, so it's just something that, you know, the more that you can test out tires in the real world, instead of looking at internet message boards, that's what I would recommend. Um, but let's get to your answer. Um, the tires that I have on, True. We'll, we'll zoom in here so you can see proof. Oh, it's probably gonna be backwards. Um, but these are Trigger. It's a, special, it's a specialized Trigger Pro. And these are 700 by 38. Um, and sometimes, basically, I on our on the frame, a 700 by 40 is going to be the widest tire that we can run in here. This and it gets pretty tight. Um, but there are a lot of different choices out there. The other thing is, is um, we have our bike set up tubeless, uh, so we're looking for a tubeless tire, you know, versus a tube tire. Just it's what. You know, we just eliminate having to deal with tubes until we puncture a tire and then we dig out a tube and put it in there. But um, it does provide a little more grace than what a tube does. Um, okay, so thanks for mentioning that because we have kind of a follow-up question. Um, do most people run tubeless tires? What would you say? I'd say it's half and half. Probably half and half. And, you know, it just kind of de depends on preference. And then, you know, how did your bike come when you bought it, you know, um, and the age of your bike? Yep. Yeah, because depending on what wheels came with the bike that you have, uh, they may not be set up to receive the tubeless tire casing itself. 
Um, so that's always a kind of a question to figure out if your wheels can support a tubeless setup. If they can't, obviously you're going to run tubes and that's, you know, no big deal. Um, if your wheels have the option to, to set up tubeless, um, they have a special kind of interface between the wheel and the um, tire, then um, you can always run a tube in them as well. If you don't have time to get the sealant quite right or they don't seal on their first go, um, but then if, if that's something that's, uh, you know, that works for you, go tubeless, make sure that your sealant is fresh before a long event, like the Tour of Herman. Um, that's kind of a common thing to watch out for with the tubeless setup is that the, the liquid sealant um, that you put in the space between the wheel and the tire uh, sometimes like gums up into these like alien formed shapes that you're not really sure how that happened. but. Um, yep, just check your check your whole bike over, um, just like you would before any event before Saturday morning, and make sure that you're ready to roll. So yeah, just don't plan on switching over from tubes to tubeless the night before the race because you will not get any sleep. So whatever you have um, coming up to the week of the race, just plan on being that and doing that. The other thing is, is you know we're still what a month and a half out. Um, just make sure your bike is serviced and checked over before then so you can get a couple of rides in to make sure that everything is working and functioning the way it is. Um, I mean, it's hard enough the way it is. And if you have brakes rubbing or your bike doesn't shift, don't worry. <laughs> Do yourself a favor and have your bike at least mechanically sound to start the race. It might not. It's a gravel ride. So normally they... Uh, during the during a, a gravel race, you just learn to deal with stuff that. So I did have a story after all. Second. Okay. Um, you're gonna have to deal with mechanicals. That's just part of riding with gravel and a couple of extra squeaks and queaks and that kind of stuff. You just learn to deal with it. But if you can at least start with a bike that's operating pretty decent, it's it's beneficial. Uh, and just one more thing about like pre-event checkups. Um, there are pockets, and I know they're getting better, but there are pockets of severe bike part shortages and outages. Um, the bike industry is, I wouldn't call it recovered. I would say it's still recovering from um, COVID-induced shipping challenges. Um, oops, gosh, I'm working the mute button sign simultaneously. Um, so in some cases, there are parts that just are simply not available for six months. Um, so the earlier that you can find that out and have uh, develop a workaround solution with your bike shop, hopefully it's the Alpine shop at Kirkwood, um, the sooner that you can do that, then you'll be uh, less stressed before the event in May. Um, okay, so let's talk about the human. Like, what do you need to oh, do? Let's do two oh, seconds oh, on this. Sorry, one more, one more note about equipment. Uh, in regards to... Some bike simple things to carry along while you're out on the ride is I would always carry at least one spare tube, a tire iron to be able to take the tire off and put a new tube in, um, a hand pump or CO2, an inflator. Those would be the basics to at least carry along and at the very least, at least have a tube. And most people are very friendly and they'll stop and help you switch a tire and they'll be carrying some stuff too, but don't expect them to give you a tube. There's some really nice people out there that will, but if they give you their tube, then they don't have a tube to fix themselves. And tubes are kind of specific to different tires. So just at least make sure that you have a tube with you. And then I would have a, an extra one or two in the car so that if you did use it, you have one to take out on the next loop with you. Um, some other, what are some other optional things to carry in your saddlebag? Um, I'll give you one guess. Duct tape. Duct tape. That fixes a lot of things. Uh, a multi-tool uh, with some Allen wrenches and a screwdriver. And mine, this one has like a chain brake tool on it if you need to do that. Um, some people carry zip ties or a patch kit. 
Um, you know, but there's only so much room and so much weight you want to carry. So you just kind of need to at least figure out what initial, what the initial pieces are that you want to carry with you. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the human. Um, what do you need to do to prepare yourself to have a great tour of Herman event or other gravel ride? Um, first is obviously training. Um, it, while the tour of Herman is set up for beginners in that you can pick your distance on Saturday, you can pick how many loops you want to do. So either 30 miles, 60 miles, or well, it's like 33, 66, 99. Um, so you can pick those distances. And then on Sunday, you can pick either 50 or a hundred. Um, but you do want to train up for whatever distance you're aiming for. So uh, if you're trying to go for a hundred miles each day, uh, that's, it's really hard. It, uh, it's so hard. Like Herman, uh, you, you know, kind of, if you're an experienced cyclist, you're like, oh, hundred miles, I can kind of knock that out without really thinking too much about it. But to try to do 200 mile days back to back in Herman, uh, it's just really challenging. The hills are short, but they're very steep. The gravel is kind of loose in spots. So you have to be able to put a lot of power down. Um, and then you need to recover Saturday night. So it's super challenging, but um, definitely worthwhile to give it a go. Um, I would say the majority of uh, participants do not do the back-to-back -back hundreds. Um, most people do like 100 the first day and 50 the next day or like 60 the first day, 50 the next day. And some people only have time on Saturday. So maybe they might come and just do the one 30 mile loop on Saturday first thing. So it's really like up to your schedule, how much you wanna do. Um, but for training, uh, you should probably, you know, get in a regular routine of cycling two to three times a week. Um, I would try to get a longer run in or a longer ride in on the weekends maybe 60 to 75% of your expected long goal. Um, so if you're aiming for a hundred mile day, make sure you can ride 60 miles before the event, just as like a training goal. Um, if you're going for those, the back-to-back, -back, you know, ultimate crushed it moment of hundred miles each day, I would try to put in like two back-to-back 80 -back mile days as a good training benchmark. Um, so it just kind of gives you gives you some idea of like how uh, long or how you know physically fit uh, you need to prepare yourself with, um, and then just practice on a variety of different services. Uh, Herman has everything. We have pavement to get in and out of the headquarters. We've got the Katy Trail that starts out loops one and three, or I'm sorry, one and four. One and four. Um, so that's like you know nice flat crushed limestone, very predictable surface. Uh, we've got uh, really like pretty chunky gravel, like, and by chunky, I mean like probably golf ball size rocks uh, that are, you know, loose and kind of gravelly. Um, there's also some really beautiful, like pa near pavement quality gravel that uh, it's not rocky at all. And it's just very, very smooth and worn in. So uh, there's just, there's everything. There's low water crossings. Um, I mean, what am I missing? Yeah, and it just just depends on how much fresh gravel they do put out uh, a week or two prior to the event. Uh, when we were there about a month ago, I think we did one loop, and it seemed like there's a quite a bit of fresh. So that you know that loop by a month, you know, by now or coming into it, that's gonna be pretty packed in and pretty nice. It's just that stuff that really hasn't been driven on much. That's kind of a little more chunky, but um, it just adds to the fun of the event, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, question in the chat. If you could only do two loops on Saturday, which two would you recommend? Definitely loop one. That's like, uh, you get to start with everybody, do the iconic loop one. There's like a, you know, it's, you go on the Katy Trail first, then you are kind of north of the, the Missouri River, some really beautiful farms. They usually have lots of like baby cows that are personally my favorite. Um, there's a climb about mile nine or 10 that just kicks everybody's butt, right? At the beginning of the day. Um, that's well, also- Once, once the, you get to the top though, it's really pretty up there. Yeah. So definitely loop one. Um, and then I would say two or three are 
fairly similar. They're both south of town. Um, two has like a pretty steep climb to start. And then three has a little bit more time on the flat pavement. Um, but they're once you get into like the meat of each of the loops, they're pretty similar uh, and difficult. <laughs> So right. uh, I would say maybe three is a little bit harder than two, but only slightly. Like they're both, um, you know, pretty similar. And I also would, in basically whatever works best for you, you know, if you're trying to get two loops done and get back to home, or if you're like, well, I want to get one done, maybe have a little lunch, relax a little bit, and then head out on the next one. Um, just whatever helps you have the best day. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a really fun question. Uh, with it being Bacon Wine Trail Weekend, do you have a favorite winery? Ooh, what's your, uh, do you have a favorite winery in Herman? I guess the only one that we've had is this. We're just like full disclosure, we're not like wine connoisseurs, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but I'll, I will recommend Stone Hill. Um, they're pretty close in town. They actually have, they have formally hosted the tour of Herman. So we're a little bit partial to them just because they have supported a lot of the cycling culture in Herman. Um, and from my like uneducated palate, their wines are great. <laughs> yeah. And, they, and they've been very good at, I don't know what it looks like for this year, but in the past, they've may have donated a few bottles, uh, for prizes and giveaways so yeah we'll definitely give them a shout out and uh there's also a brewery in town the tin mill brewery uh and they have a really very nice beverages as well we know beer we, we're like also not beer experts but like we know it a little better um what'd you get the other day i had their lager and it was pretty good yeah so um yeah and then Definitely support the restaurants there. They have amazing restaurants there. So yeah, plug for the Fourth Street Pizza. Um, they have like a New York style pizza. Sorry, we we're talking about training, right? <laughs> like hardcore sixty mile training rides plus pizza in Herman. <laughs> these, these are the rewards at the end of the day. You got to have that carrot to get you to the end of the day, and uh, yeah, nothing better than some beer and pizza or wings from uh, wings, wings of blazing. Yeah. Uh, if you do go to the pizza at Fourth Street Pizza, their salads and salad dressings are like all home, home house made, and they have this like focaccia goat cheese honey appetizer that's like we eat it for dinner, we eat it in it for breakfast, like it's awesome. Um, so that's those are my top two in Herman top two restaurants. Um, but anyway, back to training, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah, we talked about, you know, like you need to have a build up an ample uh, kind of training routine for getting ready for the event. Um, and that'll just help you flush out uh, what, you know, what you need to adjust on your bike, what clothing works for you. Um, make sure that you're choosing, well, some people ride without, you know, bike shorts with no chamois. And if that works for you, like awesome. Uh, but both of us personally would prefer a bike short with a chamois and by a chamois we need we mean like the padding that's kind of under your bottom and you know you like sit on it when you sit on the bike saddle um so something that's like nice and protective some people prefer like very thin uh levels of padding some people are like like cush to the max like there's a whole range um and it's very personal so uh kind of experiment with a couple different options see what works for you um, something that also helps with comfort on the bike saddle is a chamois cream. Um, and same thing, that's, we have a ton of options. Uh, something like a chamois butter, the purple and yellow brand, that's kind of like a thinner formula. Um, some people really like that. I personally like a thicker, like it's a coconut oil based formula called booty balm um, that you have to like, uh, like scoop out of the jar because it's solid at room temperature. Um, I feel like that lasts a little bit longer than the thinner formulas. What do you like? I use Asos, which comes in like a little container. Then I also will use D's nuts um, that comes in a squirt. So yeah, any there's like a whole variety of chamois creams. Again, like very personal, um, but just kind of give it a try and uh, see. It. The whole point of the chamois cream is to help reduce friction between your skin and your shorts and the bike seat. Um, so that when you're sitting on your bike saddle for long periods of time, um, that you won't develop any uh, friction hotspots 
that turn into saddle sores. So that's the goal of a chamois cream. Um, also sun protection is really important. You know, we're in the first week into May. It's really exciting. We're hopefully going to have some nice sunny weather, but when you're outside, especially like earlier in the springtime, uh, your skin might not be prepared for that. So definitely some sort of sunscreen or, uh, like a, a arm or leg sleeve that's sun protective. Um, definitely good options. Sunglasses, obviously those really, uh, even if it's dark out, like a cloudy day or rainy day, I would recommend a lighter tinted glasses uh, because when you're riding in a group on gravel, there's a lot of dust that gets kicked up from the bikes in front of you. There's small rocks that get kicked up. Um, there's just a lot going on and it's nice to have a hard barrier, um, either tinted or not tinted in front of your eyes so that nothing accidentally gets in your eyeball. Um, oof, obviously a helmet that's required. Um, you need to wear a helmet to participate in this event. Um, oh. then, uh, take a watch the weather the week before the event. Um, it is the first weekend of May. Um, there's been many times that I have started lap one in knee warmers, arm warmers, and a rain jacket, and some sort of hat. Um, just because it can be cool and it could be rainy. And then you go out on the second lap and you're in your shorts and in your jersey. But just make sure that you come to Herman prepared for the weather that's going to be presented to us. And even if it doesn't look like it's going to be raining, maybe just throw a shell or a jacket in just in case, because it doesn't take up a lot of space in the car. And it's really hard to find something once you get to Herman. There's just, I mean, there's a lot of wine and beer and food in Herman, but I don't know that there's a bike shop there. <laughs> so, right. you know, well, if it's raining too hard. I guess you just go to the winery, I guess. Well, you know, whatever, but, right. uh, um, just make sure that you have enough clothing to do the loops. And some people like to change out a pair of bike shorts uh, between loops or a clean jersey. Um, you know, just if it's rainy the first lap and you come back and it's dry, you might want to put on a new pair of dry clothes and then they'll get wet again. I don't know, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, just make sure that you kind of pay attention to what the weather might be. Um, okay, we got a couple good questions. Uh, showers. I'm really happy to say that yes, there are showers uh, at the event headquarters in Herman City Park. They are permanent showers. They are uh, basically, you know, built and maintained by the city of Herman because the city park where we do have the start and finish is also uh, has very limited but available uh, full RV hookups, maybe 10. Uh, I know they're building more, but I think only 10 to 12 are available uh, currently. And then there's also tent camping available through the city of Herman. It's an honor system. You know, you put your money in the envelope uh, on the shower house and turn it in. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, I think there's two women's showers. I think there's two in the men's as well, but yeah. you know, it's, so they are available. There's just not a lot available, but, uh, and they're not fancy, like maybe bring some flip-flops. Uh, definitely you need to bring all your shower or like, you know, shower soaps and towels and all that. Um, it's just a concrete block building with some showers and toilets, but it's so nice. Like, especially if you choose to camp, um, it's just so nice. Or even if you're just driving home, but you kind of have a ways to go um, to have a quick shower after the ride. So yeah, those are available uh, throughout the whole day, Saturday, Sunday, they're, they're part of the campground race HQ area. Um, and then another question is, will you have a bike shop vendor on site? Uh, yes, we will have a uh, a mechanic on site let me put it that way i don't know we'll have to check if we have the ability yeah, to sell I, I think that we'll normally and they'll no guarantees but they'll try to have uh somebody there but they're gonna be very limited in what they can do um you know probably have a couple tubes 
and might be able to do some shifting adjustments at best. But, you know, if you're expecting to get a bike overhaul or you've got a lot of things going on, don't, it's, they just don't have, they're not going to have the parts. Um, a lot of parts are very specific. So, but they'll be able to do, you know, very, very basic little assistance. Quick adjustments. Um, okay. Any other topics for human preparation? Any other questions out there? Throw them in the chat. Um, oh, oh my gosh, I love this. Oh, I spoke too loud. Look at this cute Whoa. dog. Oh, thank you, Jennifer, for sharing your adorable dog. We love dogs. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, we're going to, the next topic is just like a more general gravel event day. Just some tips. And oh, here's another one. Oh, Darla. I love it. I love it. Right, we'll see if our, our dog can come down here and make an appearance at the end. Um, she's a camera hog sometimes. Um, okay. So, uh, Ooh, this is a good question. Do you have pacing advice using heart rate or power meter? I love this question because this like leads into bike nerd data land. And that's like, I'm here for it. Um, so my pacing advice uh, I, I do not ride with power on the gravel bike. Really the only power data I use is on my trainer, which like never goes outside. Um, so I'm not going to really answer power, but I will talk about heart rate and really, I mean, really it's the same power or heart rate, whatever metric you're using, you want to make sure that you're, you're keeping yourself, uh, in your, whatever your aerobic zone is, um, for, especially in the first half of the day, whatever that means for you, keep yourself in that aerobic heart rate or power zone. Um, and you can, you know, figure out those zones with a lot of different testing that uh, I think even like Strava will help you figure out those zones, training peaks, all that stuff. Um, but it's a long day and you cannot be expected to be outputting, uh, anaerobic or sprinting type power for, you know, really longer than 20, 30 minutes. If you're super fit, um, so keep things aerobic. Um, so and for anyone with non power or heart rate metrics, that's keep things conversational. Um, make sure if you, if someone asks you a question, you could answer them in a full complete sentence and not be like <sighs> gasping for breath. Um, obviously there's like some, and the re like, there's some of these short, really steep hills that like, whatever you do, uh, you're going to be in those higher output in out, output anaerobic zones. Um, and that's kind of unavoidable, but you just need to make sure you pace yourself throughout the day so that when you do need that really high power up output to get up and over a hill that you have that ability. Um, and then you, might, you might be walking like truth be told, I think I walked Saturday when we were out there, uh, for a little bit, it wasn't so much like a lack of power, although that's definitely a factor for me right now, but it was more like, I'm just, we've been on this loose, really slow gravel for a really long time. And I just needed a mental break. So, um, if you find yourself like really, you know, constantly spiking your power or your heart rate so that it's, you know, you're gasping for breath, like maybe take a walk break and get your heart rate and power back down. Um, and then kind of continue on at a more conversational effort. Um, and then you'll have something in the tank left for that last sprint to the finish. Um, that's always exciting and there's spectators there. Um, okay. So the event, uh, we kind of already talked about the types of gravel that you may encounter at tour of Herman or any other gravel event, um, pavement, not really gravel, but that's a surface you'll be riding on, uh, some sort of limestone crushed trail, like the Katy trail that is common in some areas. Um, a really well hard packed dirt or gravel road that's super smooth, like you could ride it on 23C road tires and just be happy as a clam, you'll see that. Um, then you'll see like the super chunk, which is like those uh, up to golf ball size gravel that's, especially when it's loose and not packed in yet by vehicle traffic, uh, it's very challenging and taxing to ride through that. Um, You'll also see, it's not so much common in Missouri, but like in other events, like especially in Iowa, there's a very famous event that uses B roads, B maintenance roads. That's like uh, dirt, very dirt 
poorly. It's a, but far, it's a far it's a farmer two track that the farmer uses between fields with his tractor. There's yeah. most of them. So and I say poorly maintained, but like that's their purpose is like they're not supposed to be maintained. They're not maintained. They're not or they're not at all. Um, and especially in that kind of scenario when you see like a very uh rarely used dirt road um when it's dry they're fine um they might be a little bit more bumpy but they're fine but when things get wet they are very very difficult to ride and the mud just like clings to your bike uh if you attempt to roll through it even if you're not on your bike and you just like walk next to your bike and roll it through the mud uh, it just clings to everything and suddenly your bike weighs 50 pounds, not exaggerating. Um, so just be aware of the surfaces that you're riding in. Uh, obviously, if it's paved limestone, Katy Trail, or like the really hard packed dirt, uh, you can kind of let up your guard a little bit. Um, but if it's that loose, chunky gravel, you really have to pay attention and keep your wheels tracking where you want them to be. Keep the power coming down so that you can make progress. Um, and then if anything turns to mud, that even just like a whisper of it starts clinging to your bike, like get off and pick your bike up. Um, there's another famous race in Stillwater, Oklahoma, that is known about the red mud. Uh, it's called the Mid-South. And we've both experienced the mud down there. It's, you know, it's like, oh, it doesn't, it lo doesn't look too wet. I really want to ride my bike. I came to Oklahoma to ride my bike. I think I can do it. I'm strong. And then you ride like three feet into the mud and suddenly your bike is caked. Your wheels, like they, oh, you can't see, but they like, they won't even turn. Like they won't roll. They'll just be stuck because so and much you have, mud you have the clay that's is like, built up um, here or down at your chain stay. And it's like, it's impossible to roll even your bike. So um, just heads up. And if that starts to happen to you, just hop off swallow the ego and the pride. That's very difficult to do, but um, hop off, pick up your bike and carry, make forward progress somehow. So pretty much everything in Hermes can be rideable. Right. So yeah, you don't that's, have to worry about that's just that. General. Emily's taking it to another level here. Dramatic. Uh, okay. So Earl mentioned also before that the course is not closed to traffic. Um, so there will be traffic on the roads. Uh, also, like he mentioned, the gravel roads are very lightly trafficked, um, but the paved roads, especially, I believe, I think it's Highway 100 that you use for the um, access to loops two, three, and five south of town. Um, that highway is like, it's a two lane highway. There's a sort of adequate shoulder for some of it. Um, and there's parts of it that have a great shoulder, but it's just, it's a busy road and people are fast. Uh, they drive quickly on that road. So um, especially when you're on the pavement, single file all the way to the right, heads up with what's going on. Um, we've pulled over, you know, if like, if we notice that there's a car, been a car behind us for a minute or so, we find a driveway and just pull over real quick, let the car go past and then keep going back on the pavement. Um, this is a hobby for us and, you know, almost hundred percent of the, I would say, I would say hundred percent of the people at tour of Herman, um, it's a hobby and it's like, okay, if we, if we stop for 30 seconds or a minute on the side of the road to let a car safely pass us, um, that's worth it to me than being involved in a, you know, a car vehicle collision, uh, very dangerous. So just stay to the right side of the road, um, on the pavement, if you had a red, a red blinky light, um, pavement is a great time to use those. Uh, and then kind of another thing to watch out for at Herman is uh, dogs, not, not like your all's nice dogs that are like cuddly and cute and adorable, um, but dogs that are out that are not used to seeing bicycles cross their territory in front of their house. Yeah, what do you I do mean, well, well we, we encountered, I mean, it seems like every year you encounter um, some dogs that are out. Uh, for the most part, we really have not had any issues, but, you know, just give them a good shout and tell them to go back home or something. And uh, most, if it's a nice day, most of the owners are often out in their front yard with their dogs and they'll try to make an attempt to uh, call them back or they just tell you it's harmless as it's showing teeth and 
going towards your ankle, you know, and it's like, well, maybe not so harmless, but okay. Another strategy for dogs, like, you know, shouting no, shouting go home. Um, the water bottle squirt. The water bottle squirt. You know, you'll have some drink, hopefully, in your bottle at that time, and just a quick cheep, 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 cheep. And that is usually distracting enough for the dog that uh, they just, they forget for a second and then you're gone down the road and it doesn't hurt them. Um, okay, here's a good question. Will there be a sweep vehicle besides the photographers? Um, I do not know the answer to this question. We will need to find out and have uh, the shop included in the next event dispatch email, but it's a really good question. Um, for safety, I know we keep track of all of our riders out on each loop. So we write down, you know, the time that you started the loop um, and then the time you finished it. But uh, I don't know if there's an actual physical suite vehicle that goes out on the last, um, behind the last rider. So we will confirm for you. I think let's, I don't know if there's much else, but maybe we're getting late to where we should just maybe open up to questions. Yes. Okay. So you guys are doing some great job with the questions here in the chat. Um, I'll take, let's see, we'll do everything in here. So how is the event timed? Is there an official start time for each day? Yes, there is an official start time for each day. It is 8 a.m. Saturday and Sunday. It's a, a mass start. Um, so everybody will line up at the starting grid. Um, this year we'll have a spaced out starting area so that we're not like all clumped together, which is actually safer from a bike perspective anyway, but also safer from a COVID perspective. Um, so we'll have people spaced out. Um, and then when you come in off of each lap, uh, we have a timer that records your time uh, that you finish each lap. And then um, we do have a part, both participation prizes that we kind of spread out throughout the day. And then the top riders uh, who do the most, you know, like all five loops throughout the weekend, there are prizes for those top riders. Um, but I'm just being honest, like there's not a lot of emphasis in uh, like the, the fast, speedy people at the front of the crowd. Um, we do have a lot of really talented, speedy riders that come and use it as a training event, which is like awesome. Um, but it's not like Tour of Herman is not that kind of race that we're only here for the, you know, top podium finishers and then, you know, go, go home. Like it's more uh, just the Alpine Shop in general, like we're here for people who are wanting to get into cycling more, try something new, have a great time in the outdoors. Um, so that's really the focus is more towards a um, like fun atmosphere and encouraging everybody no matter how fast they complete the ride. But yes, there is official timing and we do record your times and people who do the most distance in the shortest time are recognized in a very small way. Uh, is there a water station on the longer loops? You wanna take this one? No. <laughs> is that the answer? That's the answer. The answer <laughs> is no. Um, so just be prepared to, um, you know, bring two bottles or three bottles or have a hydration thing. The other thing is, is that um, depending on your comfort level, if you wanna go knock on somebody's door and say, hey, I'm out of water and I could really use some help. Most everybody out there is very friendly and they'd probably fill your bottles and give you a peanut butter jelly sandwich or grill you a hot dog or whatever, but um, they might have beer too, I don't know. But um, just be prepared to provide your own beverages. And really none of the loops take you through a town that you're gonna be able to stop at a convenience store or anything. Everything is really pretty promote. The other thing is, is if you wanna uh, bring some iodine or bleach and pull from one of the creeks, uh, that's option two. Okay, we do got another cute dog alert, sorry. Or maybe, is that a dog or a cat, Mark? at a dog yeah okay just just saying hi <laughs> um yeah. okay so yeah be, you need to be self-sufficient on all of these loops um there's no aid stations out there uh other than what you supply at your own uh kind of staging area oh it's a cat okay cute <laughs> oh and there are some people that um put 
coolers at the end of their driveways with some bottled water, or they might have a hose that's out on the end that you can fill with. So there are some people that once they let know that we're coming, that you might encounter that. And the keyword is might, and I have no idea where you're gonna find it. But when you do, it's amazing. Um, okay, another question. Is the parking near the start finish? Yes, uh, there is limited parking. Um, so the, the full hookup RV slots are actually very close to the start finish. Um, and then I would say there's room uh, maybe for 50 cars pretty close and another 100 cars not too much farther away. So yes, there's like there's a pretty wide range of parking. There's a couple of different lots. You can park on the um, on portions of the uh, road that goes through the city park. Um, those are pretty well signed about where parking is allowed on the city park road. Um, and so the, yeah, the option is to park your vehicle and kind of have your own aid station at your vehicle for in between loops. That's very common. Um, people you know, come in, they cross the finish line and after they finish, let's say loop one, they go to their vehicle, stock up on a couple new water bottles and then they go out on loop two, um, very common. Uh, if, if for some reason you wanna just like maximize your rolling time, I, I've seen also people bring their own coolers and just set them up very close to the race HQ or event HQ. Um, and then they eliminate the, the um, risk of potentially, you know, arriving later to the event, parking farther away. They just bring their cooler to the start finish line and then they have all their stuff right there. So that's an option as well. Um, okay, in addition to the GPS files, will any of the routes be marked? Uh, I would say they are marked, but it's, it's not like, don't plan to just go on a bike ride at Tour of Herman with nothing. Be prepared for either some sort of map to bring with you that you can print from the website, a cue card sheet with the turns shown, a GPS file, an app on your phone. Like you need to have something to help you navigate but it's like and the reason i say what they're sort of marked like uh spray painting pavement is easy so when you cross a highway it's easy to say you know loop one turn right loop two go straight it's very simple um but the turns on the gravel it's very uh challenging to spray paint anything on gravel because it moves around um and then if we use stakes or flagging at the turns um they have, I don't know if this has happened at Herman specifically, but just in general, like those are easy to tamper with. If you are a person of, you know, negative attitudes towards bikes, um, they're easy to tamper with those course marking signs. So um, just be prepared to be self-sufficient. And then when you see markings on course, you, that'll be like a feel good, like, okay, confirmed. Um, this is where I turn or go straight. Do you want to unmute and see if there's a question? Yeah, can I, uh, so does anyone uh, have like a question that you want to ask specifically? Raise your, I don't, I'm not super experienced in like Zoom hosting land, um, but either type it in the chat or do the raise hand feature and, uh, or, just unmute or unmute, yeah. If we dare go down that road. <laughs> okay, any other follow-ups? Okay, you guys have been great. Um, once again, I wanna apologize for uh, the late start, um, but we've recorded this whole thing. So this will be available on the Off-Road Racing League um, website for you to view, maybe not tonight, but shortly. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, come to the Alpine Shop in Kirkwood. Uh, the bike shop there is a really good resource. resource. Joe, Carrie, um, wonderful people and great, great uh, library of knowledge about cycling and gravel. Um, is there an email that they can send something to? I think the email is, is marketing at alpineshop.com. It's pretty easy to remember. Marketing at alpineshop.com. I think that's the email for all your questions um, or just call the shop and we'll get them answered. Um, 
we don't, we're not there on a daily basis, but they know how to track us down. Right. If there's yeah. anything if we else, can help with. Nothing else, if you call the shop and leave a message, get a message to them and then they'll reach out to us and we'll try to get you answers back. Oh, yep, here we go. T-O-H at alpineshop.com. That's the way to go. T-O-H, tour of Herman, T-O-H at alpineshop.com. Okay, that's it, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us. Um, and can't wait to see you on the gravel. Have a good night. Bye.